I think too many people are afraid of taking chances, of taking risk. And as long as that risk is somewhat mediated, is somewhat calculated, you know what, risk is a really good thing. And those that don't step out of the box, those that don't take that risk, mm -hmm. wind up being stuck in a rut for quite a while. Hey everyone, I am here with Scott Bauer, everyone, and we are his successful entrepreneurs. I met him last night at this uh, financial summit and in Orlando, wanted to talk to him, interview him about his uh, uh, steps and daily routines. So we get going. Scott, tell us a little bit about yourself, please. And it is true, Mark and I met last night and uh, he got me an Uber, which was fantastic. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, I am currently the CEO of Prosper Trading Academy and I have been in the financial business since right out of college. Uh, went to work for an investment banking firm right out of college. Hated sitting behind a desk pushing a pencil all day. A friend of mine got me into the trading business back almost 30 years ago. Now, the, the trading business back then is obviously a lot different than it is now. But back then, you got in and you got onto the floor as a clerk just because you had a friend. Now, if you do get a, a job you know, on a trading floor, which there aren't many of them anymore, it's all corporate. It's all with the big guys. So I started my career back at the CBOE, Chicago Board Options Exchange, back in 1990. Worked my way up from a clerk, floor trader, became a partner in one of the largest option trading firms in the world at the time, Boda Capital Management, B-O-T-T-A, left Boda, went on to do some, uh, start some businesses on my own and then was recruited back actually by Goldman Sachs to come run their operation in the S&P 500 pit at the CBOE, hmm. where I was a vice president for Goldman Sachs, did that for a few years, then came on into this trading education space. Here I am today as the leader, as the CEO of Prosper Trading Academy. Awesome, so look, a couple of questions, are very simple. Number yeah. one, Scott, what's your definition of wealth? My definition of wealth is being able to get up every morning, count my blessings that I have three healthy kids, a fantastic family, and quite frankly, that I don't have to worry about what I'm going to have for dinner tonight. That part, though, is so secondary, and, and it sounds sappy, to the family, to the friendship, and to most importantly for me, or just as importantly, being part of the community and giving back to the community. Awesome, man. Yeah. Uh, what about daily routines? You know, I've asked everybody today, daily routine, to me, it's super important as an entrepreneur, someone who has like to did the grind for 22 years. Yeah. Uh, what are at least one thing or more that you do every day that sets you up for success? First thing I do when I get up in the morning, brush my teeth, <laughs> make my coffee, and after I make my coffee, I actually write a letter to my three boys. Every really? Morning, just, a, just a short little note that used to be by hand, now it's a, a small text. Every single morning, they're sleeping, they're probably sleeping for another five, six hours, uh -huh. and I send that off, and you know what, regardless of what else is going on around me, that puts the right foot forward to start every day. Awesome, is there any other routine, like on the business side, that you do when you come at work? I mean, at what time do you start? What do you do? I mean, is there any ritual that you do? So I'm usually up about five o'clock into the office about six, mm -hmm. you know, look, previewing the day ahead of us, previewing what happened in the markets overnight, right. really getting prepared, getting our daily newsletters prepared, right. and, and really just trying to wonder what our clients and what everybody out there wants to know about the trading day ahead. So I ask myself, if I were on the other side, if I was going to be getting this email in an hour, mm -hmm. what would I want to know here? And that's kind of how we start our day out. You have been a, a fairly successful entrepreneur. Uh, to your opinion, what are the key ingredients and the most important stuff when it, talks, when it comes to entrepreneurship? So number one, I think, is don't be afraid of risk taking, right? So everything in life, whether it's a, a trade, whether it's a new job, everything comes with reward to risk and you have to measure reward to risk. I think too many people are afraid of taking chances, of taking risk. And as long as that risk is somewhat mediated, is somewhat calculated, you know what, risk is a really good thing. And those that don't step out of the box, those that don't take that risk, mm -hmm. wind up being stuck in a rut for quite a while. 
So yeah, that comes to the next question then. Uh, let's say we have someone looking and watching us. They want to come out of this road. They really have a, a strong desire to be successful, but they are, let's say, making only $40,000 and they want to 10x that. They really want to, to think big. Any specific steps you would recommend for people who want to 10x their life? Don't let anybody else make decisions for you. Don't look at something and say, ah, oh, this is too good to be true. You know what? You have to obviously evaluate opportunities right. as they come to you, but people make and create their own opportunities. You have to be a go-getter, you have to be aggressive, and you have to go out and you have to look for those opportunities because rarely does anything fall in your lap. So, you know, my probably my two biggest pieces of advice is don't let other people dictate what you can or can't do or what you should or shouldn't do and always be on the lookout for something better. Wow, okay, interesting. Now, in terms of income, you recommend people to do what? To be entrepreneurs, to do what? What do you think is the fastest path to 10X? Well, it depends what stage you are in your life, right? If, if you're our age, middle age in our <laughs> life, okay. you know, it might be a little bit more difficult to, to be in a startup, to be an entrepreneur, though you can still be an entrepreneur right. every day of your life because right. Creativity never stops. Right. Ideas should never stop. That being said, though, you know, if you're at a younger stage, right out of college, mid 20s, maybe even 30, it's a little bit easier to take some of those, you know, let's say off the cuff risks, right. off the cuff chances at doing something new. But that being said, don't ever be afraid to have an idea and to run with it, regardless of what age you're at. Okay, awesome. What about like specific investments that you believe in? What are like, let's say the three best investments that you believe in? Like you would tell uh, your son, you know, son, these are the three things that I believe you should put your money in. Okay, so one of them is still the cryptocurrency space. Really? It is. Okay, interesting. It is, even with this massive Any percentage sum, of your portfolio you would indicate? Very small, under 5%. Under 5%, okay. Under 5%, and in fact, my three boys who are 19, 21, and 24, yeah. all with their own money, do have investments in some crypto funds. Really? Not, yep, not just individual buying tokens here and there, uh -huh. but crypto funds because it's something that we've talked about and something I do believe. Why do you believe in this? Is going to, why do I believe in it? Yeah. Because the technology behind it. I don't necessarily believe in every single altcoin that's out there. So you believe in the blockchain? I believe in the blockchain. I believe this is the next wave of technology, much like the internet was in the early 90s, right. and to see where it is today. So I think that that an emerging market class, an emerging uh, equity class like uh -huh. that doesn't come around every day. And I think this is an opportunity to take a small part right. of your portfolio. So by the way, in the, uh, what are your favorite coins then? Well, I think for now you have to stay with the big boys, that being Bitcoin in Ethereum. Yeah. There's a couple others that I really like that have now really started penetrating in the banking sector. Right. Ripple's obviously one of them right. that people have followed, but another one is Civic, CVC is the symbol. So watch out for that one. How much is that? CVC? Uh, right now it's down about 40 cents. Okay, okay, cool, yeah. interesting. And um, now that was Bitcoin, that was one. So what else? That's 5% of your portfolio. Yes. So I still have 95% of uh, allocation to help our uh, community. <laughs> exactly. And, and you know, if you're in the 20 to 35 range, you definitely want to be more aggressive with, with your, your retirement or your, you right. know, any, any money you have with your wealth. So at that point, you know, I think you need to be in equities, even though we've had, you know, just a massive run up in the marketplace. Right. You can't look on what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, next month. Where am I going to be in 10 or 15 years from now? Right. And so it's definitely it definitely makes sense at the younger age to be in a higher percentage of equities. Right. As you get a little bit older, maybe you start to weed out of that a little bit, get into some more fixed income, some more bond funds. Right perhaps but you know what equities is still the space to be in even if we get a 10 15 20 percent right. correction in this marketplace i've been told the good rule to help people on that is you take your age like for instance i'm 46 46 should be my allocation in bonds or safe stuff safe income so 46 46 percent of your income in safe stuff the opposite 54 percent should be more aggressive in equity or equity funds like Vanguard. You yeah. know, 90% of the hedge funds at the end of the day don't, don't even beat the uh, Not at all. They don't, don't beat the S&P 500. They don't. They don't. You're right. 
but that's a, that's a pretty good number. It's a good thing at 51 that I'm pretty close to being balanced at, at that number that you yeah, talked about. You have to be so. balanced over 50 now. <laughs> that's right. That's awesome. So right. um, now you and I have been the options trader for a long time and we are big believers on selling income, taking advantage of that time decay with a small portion of your uh, portfolio. What do you recommend that portion be for people? So what's really interesting is my background is actually as a premium buyer. Okay. Which, which is very unusual. That's Most interesting people, to me. Right? Very, it's very used. unusual. So, and that comes from my trading days on the floor. Right. Where I, I most of the time was a volatility buyer and scalped my positions around my long premium. So, yes. I so, you have, were buying uh, low volatility and selling high volatility? It, yes, exactly. Okay. And yes, I would have thousands and thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars of premium decay a day. Right. But that was measured against being able to scalp stock around that uh -huh. premium decay. So I have always tended to be on the buy side. Now, doing what we do now and doing what I do now and teaching it in options volatility class, I take advantage of volatility. So if volatility is low, I'm buying it. If volatility is high, I'm selling it and collecting the premium. Right. Okay, awesome stuff. Uh, last but not least, yeah. Scott now and Scott 20 years ago, wow. what is the big difference in terms of where your mindset was then, your mindset now? How do you think about life and, and your success and, and start the, the early days? So in the early days, it was, it was a free for all, right? I started trading down on the, on the trading floors when I was 22 years old. Right. So back in the, uh, you know, in the early 90s, uh, you know what? It was, you didn't think much past the next day. Now, 30 years later, my thought process is definitely more about capital, capital preservation. preservation. Yeah. Right. You're like me. You wise up. <laughs> no, no doubt about it. But honestly, from a lifestyle, um, you know, I've been through some challenges in my life and from a lifestyle, honestly, I take every day as it may be my last day and live life to the fullest. Wow, that's great. You know what? I forgot to ask you a question then if we can squeeze in because yeah, we are sure. short here. So I, I want just one question. When you surround yourself, whether it's team members in your organization or friends, is there any particular things that are important to you, like in terms of personality and stuff like that? Absolutely. My team members, especially the, you know, my, my partners, they all have to be collaborative. Okay. If they are single-minded, if they want to shut people out, if they think that their decisions are the end-all be-all, right. I want nothing to do with them. So how do I, you do that brainstorming process with everyone? I open it up and I am the leader of the company, but I am also the best listener in the company. So I want input from every single person, right. whether it's the sales floor, right. whether it's my sales manager, whether it's my COO, I want input and I want everybody to feel as their input is valued. Right. And then, you know, we kind of digest everything, right. but to be successful, a good general has to be surrounded by phenomenal sergeants and phenomenal corporate corporals, right? right? They have to be inclusive. Everybody has to know that they are valued from the top down to the bottom. I've been in situations before where, you know, the chairman of a company or, or the president of a company where it's been almost like a, a, a single autocratic, you know, type of, of ruling authority. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't right. work that way. That's not how I do it. That's awesome. That Ray Dalio, guys, there's a great book, Principles from Ray Dalio, the Bridgewater principle that is awesome. He talks about that, that being super transparent, to be very honest with yourself, yep. to be able to grow and build and make the right decisions. And he takes constructive criticism from the lowest guy to the top guy. And you know what, it, it builds trust right. and it builds faith in your team. Right. Right. In the vision, in the vision. As exactly. Well. Right. Exactly. What about your personal friendship and stuff? Do you have like a personal way? Like you get friends with everybody and that's fine? Or you really are very careful who you surround yourself with? I would say that my closest friends, my closest friend group is pretty small. Wide range of acquaintances, I would say. Right. But I really like to keep those, you know, close to me, you know, very close to, very close to the vest. Again, friendly with a lot of people. Right. Um, but really close to me is right. I would say a smaller group of people. Right. We were talking about the influence of, of surrounding yourself, uh, that you are the average 
in terms of your spirit, your health, your finances, of the five percent you surround yourself the most. You believe in that? I do, and I, you know what? What you just said, I'd say I'm in the one percent. And not because of the wealth aspect, but I'd say I'm in the one percent because of the people that I'm surrounded by, my family, my close knit right. friends. So I truly value right. that part of my life, and right. I look at that and say, yeah, I'm in the one percent. Wow, awesome! Hey, Scott, awesome! Thank you for your feedback. Met Scott last night. Awesome guy, and very successful from what I understand from everyone here. You take care, everybody. See you.